So I want to get into sort of issues surrounding South African politics, or at least uh, the parliamentary um, facilitation of South African politics. Um, it seems to me that Parliament is not is not being used robustly enough. Um, I, I don't actually know the details of the rules that constrain such things, but I would say that um, if, if only policy is going to be debated, um, it seems that Parliament is, is going to uh, be diminished in its role of performing a vital function in society, especially a function that is needed at the moment, um, which is, in essence, getting out in front of a lot of, you know, the potential toxic issues. I mean, it, it is, if I was a parliamentarian, I would sort of, what, imagining having debates about general issues that don't directly link to policy or that sort of might have a bearing on policy in the future. Getting out in front of these things, you know, might sort of be opening the can of worms. Um, but, you know, even just sort of, Entrousing the the very toxic and vile rhetoric from the EFF, you know, it's like Julius Malema complaining about being charged under apartheid legislation. I mean, obviously, you know, if if anyone is going to think about this reasonably, it it is not um, the Riotous Assemblies Act or whatever it's called. It, that act alone is not. Uh, what made the act unjust, what made the act unjust was the legitimacy of the state because of its undemocratic um, uh, structure. You know, so, so, so the, the illegitimacy of the legislation was not owing to the legislation itself. It was owing to the, in essence, the character of the general uh, legal dispensation at the time. There's nothing defective about the act itself. In fact, the act itself, um, there's nothing offensive about it, uh, uh, probably. I mean, uh, but at least the, the, the part of it that, that, um, that Ju uh, Julius Malema is being charged with, uh, you know, to, to simply uh, label it apartheid-era legislation. I mean, is he not going to use any of the roads that were built during apartheid? You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's ludicrous. And so to sort of get out in front of, of issues like this, which essentially haven't capitalized on, I mean, obviously, if you debated, let's say, the validity of... Leg I mean, if, if there was something defective about the legislation, why, isn't, why hasn't it been repealed and replaced since then? Why hasn't it been, you know... I mean, in essence, you might want to change the label on it. You might want to stick a different name on it. But... You know, essentially, the reason why law is not revised is because there's nothing wrong with it, essentially. And there was ample time and scope, you know, f for anything offensive uh, to be uh, challenged constitutionally, uh, for, for, for it to be altered by Parliament. Um, you know, simply castigating it as apartheid era legislation, I mean, is just another way of playing the race card. And... If, if the kind of emotional argumentation comes out about, you know, if you were to create a general debate about apartheid-era legislation or legislation made during apartheid and a survey of it or something like that, and then people sort of uh, uh, bring out these long uh, stories about, you know, how this piece of legislation was used to unfairly discriminate against people, I mean... Uh, you can just sort of, you know, that's not the subject of the debate, actually. That emotionally charged history, I mean, like, uh, I mean, uh, is, the, I mean, the person bringing up such a story, I mean, what is their proposal? Is their proposal to change the name of that legislation, to simply reissue it under a different title, so as to kind of, I mean, like, you know, because that, that alone is not relevant to the debate. And in fact, bringing it up just to kind of, end the debate so that people can get away with their toxic, divisive, racialist programs um, of collective racialist justice, which conceals uh, and, and makes invisible uh, a, a continual and never-ending cycle of corruption um, in the state, is, you know, uh, 
you know, that, that gives you the opportunity to name the what is actually the cause, you know, and, and to create a thesis, create a, um, at least, you know, even if people are going to say the disgusting things that they say, at least then it can be used to, it, it, you, you can bring it up because it, it was actually used by them in an argument to make that point. You can create a political discourse around it. You can make it an issue. You can lay out the moral landscape, as it were. You, you can point to it. Rather than having... I mean, I, I don't see how Parliament exactly runs in terms of arguments. You know, it, to sort of to say that, you know, to, to never facilitate argument seems to me, um, you know... Do people allow questions? You know, like, I, I want to raise a point of order to ask a question. No, they must ask, try to ask a question. You know, the, the, the British system, um, the Westminster system, you know, essentially, you are, you are wishing to intervene to go on a, a, a side um, uh, to, to deceive. I mean, obviously, it's problematic if people are simply asking fake questions, simply to derail. I mean, they, they've got quite... A better system in that they do not call their fellow parliamentarians honourable, they call them right honourable friends. And to call someone an honourable friend essentially lays down the, the proper um, prefix uh, uh, that essentially means that you can't just say they are just wrong. You cannot just simply say this person is just saying something that is just wrong. You actually have to, because they're a right honourable friend, or being an honourable friend, they are not just wrong. They are wrong because. They are wrong because of some kind of substantiation. And then that substantiation can be responded to. So it's the, it's the substantive point that then builds into the distinction in politics and the, 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 the possibility of persuasion and seeing the other side. And engaging with the other side. Now, there is a problem with fundamentally with fascistic politics, is that it doesn't, in essence, deal with substance, or at least the substance that it brings up is a character, um, a character attack. You know, it just calls people racist. Ironically, a fascist politics says, you know, you're not being just to the the racial justice, the collective racialist vision, or, or, or whatever it may may be. And they just de denigrate, through comparison to their image-based morality, anyone who isn't promoting the same image, the same symbolism, um, the same reduction of, of, of uh, uh, the issues involved into their simplistic moral calculus. Um, and essentially, it all banks on the fact that they must be the representative of the, of the morally righteous um, point, you know, essentially, when, when these kinds of demagoguery arguments are being deployed, it's that, you know, uh, God is on my side, I'm the represent, I'm the almost the divine representative of the identity, I am its savior, I'm trying to save the identity, you know, so it's always in the, these kinds of these stark terms that you are, are the obstacle, you are the hurdle, and I am the representative of justice for my identity. And it all hinges essentially on an integrity argument that I have all the integrity and you have none of the integrity. And this is problematic because that means the only way to tackle it is to go after their character, is essentially to make a kind of ad hominem. The only substitute, and essentially, and I would say that they have opened the door because their argumentation, their basic political points, is ad hominem against their opposition, is saying that they are evil. And so I don't see how you can really get out of that by except by combating them in the sense that you you label them as evil and then you give a substantiation as to how they are destabilizing secular politics as it were and creating this 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 cult of the identity um and and removing principles and replacing them with these symbolic images uh, which can be used and spoken on behalf of while all this corruption takes place um invisibly and how, how effective that ideological corruption is at, at concealing that kind of corruption, um, so that kind of state corruption and, and that kind of corruption in business and, and, and all these things and the kind of weird connections they have with business as they are supposedly pretend to be socialistic. But fascism has always disguised itself in left, leftist rhetoric. Um, 
uh, at, while being completely hypocritical and having double standards all over the place. And they get away with it because it all rests on don't call me bad. Don't denigrate me. I'm just the righteous representative of, of justice for my identity. You know, so it's this kind of tautological thing that you can't, um, you know, it, unless you are allowed to go after them, um, they're ad hominem. And I would say that there is an argument that, that you can do that because of how assertive and aggressive their politics is, because essentially they can only prove that they are righteous by calling other people racist and evil. And so, you know, if you're going to say that their argument that other people are racist is a substantive point, but your argument against their character is not a substantive point, it's a point of, you know, that their dignity must be protected. I mean, that is essentially destabilizing the whole liberal democratic, you know, they've basically found a way to hack the system. And if you're not going to have people that are chairing these sorts of, of issues philosophically and are going to be sensitive to that kind of exploitation by fascist politics, I mean, you know, you are going to have a problem, you know, if, if, if you can't sort of draw that case, if you can't sort of make that, that contention and explain that um, essentially uh, that very destructive and toxic debasement of, of democratic, um, you know, so, uh, this is the problem is, is that fascists have always abused liberal democracies. Um, they've always been able to, and this is why it's also bad not to just evolve into a kind of ad hominem against ad hominem, because that just aids them in their destabilization of the system. And so you don't just make an ad hominem against them. You have to ask them a question. This is the only way to show them, uh, or to, to, to at least show to the audience, to, uh, to, 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 to show to the wider um, public uh, and, and, and the wider uh, a real politic uh, to, to, to bring out how they are antithetical to procedure and principle is that you have to point out um, through questions that they are intolerant of principles, that, 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 that um, there's just a complete and utter breakdown. And, you know, this can be, you have to, ask very simple questions. I mean, sort of, I know that this doesn't, uh, this doesn't apply directly because uh, this, this altercation was between a, a speaker and, and a, a party whip. But, you know, um, to ask, uh, is it confusing that someone has a political view that you disagree with? Um, are you being intolerant of an opposing political view uh, to, to that of your own? Um, you know, I, I, I assert that what you call confusing is actually challenging your political opinion and the discomfort that you have in challenging your political opinion, uh, is, um, a manifestation of your intolerance or at least trying to, um, you know, so your so-called assistance of trying to remove confusion, in fact, is a way for you to, um, is it not a way for you to, um, to censor political debate that is challenging to your political view or, or your, your, uh, p um, political position? I, I, I do think the more sinister thing is, is that in that thing, uh, you know, the, this is problematic is when the, the ideological corruption is so patent you know, that it's so obvious, it's very hard not to sort of try to formulate it in such a way as to make the principle the tip of the sword, as it were. And every time you just evolve into a kind of ad hominem mudslinging thing, you are really perpetuating the general destabilization of the liberal democratic ideal, and you're almost playing into the hands of, well, we just need then, let's just, let's just dispense with all of this, let's just have a justice for the identity, because that at least is clear enough, that's crisp enough in people's heads. And trying to, trying to, trying to create an opposition to it that merely reaches the same volume of simplicity, in some sense, the volume of of sort of bottom line convenience that doesn't distinguish itself as being in character different 
sadly plays into the general narrative that we just need to loom closer and closer to justice for the identity. I understand this is a very fine line. And it can always be fixed by subtexts after the fact. It can always be fixed by the interpretation of what was going on after the fact. And so, you know, even as specific altercations might not be the best exemplar possible, they might not have been the best illustration, at least then in the, in the aftermath, it can be recontextualized and fixed that way. So, I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to, you know, it doesn't, you don't ever have to have this pristine engagement. You can always uh, sort of um, uh, fill in uh, uh, the, and the, the elaboration and perhaps the, 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 how the way, how the exchange should have gone. I mean, I, I would say in, in that particular incident, uh, um, Uh, the, the only thing I think, uh, the only apology that could be made on behalf of the DA is that rather than just continuing to call the ruling rubbish, um, it would have been better to say that uh, tentatively uh, uh, the statement or the comment would be withdrawn if the ruling would be withdrawn um, because of its unreasonable nature and uh, essentially because of its partisan um, suppression uh, of opposition politics and its embarrassing and vague uh, substantiation that, that does not even correlate to a protectable interest. You know, the idea that the speaker wishes to save parliament from being confused um, on behalf of his own better judgment over partisan political um, content is, you know, uh, I'm saying this in, in rather wordy ways. There are simpler ways of formulating uh, these things. I mean, I'm, I'm quite verbose. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that th th there are slightly better um, sort of uh, uh, formulations um, and interpretations of what I just said, but that, that illustrate that technical point in a, in a more concise manner. And obviously that would be the way to sort of, um, but what's important is that it's not too simple that the principle does not become the tip of the sword. You know, the, the, it, it is the principle and not the emotion um, that must be used uh, so that it doesn't just generate more and more chaos essentially for for the the image based moral system essentially to um to become the conduit of saving the general system or something like that or, or saving um or being the conduit of the of the moral solution uh to the mess that we're in because you know that is essentially uh then we're all going to hell in a handbasket um no, I, and so I do think that there needs to be more substantive argument in Parliament, and I don't see the room where that actually is supposed to happen. I mean, if it only happens during general policy debate, uh, during debate on policy that is about to be passed, um, it seems that Parliament is never going to fulfill its democratic function. Um, So yes, if you ha I think to have a debate about legislation made during apartheid uh, that currently persists in the canon of law and its validity, if that were to sort of, um, if that were the subject of the debate, obviously, uh, people will obviously use it as an excuse to um, to generate racialist rhetoric, and then you can point that out and you can say, you know, well, actually. Essentially, what we're dealing with is, is the Rightist Assemblies Act, is it something that should be repealed? Is it something that needs to be renamed? Is there something intrinsically wrong with it? What is intrinsically wrong with the laws that are on the books? Is there anything wrong with the laws that are on the books? You know, is basically the question. Rather than just having people scoring these points um
or I mean, it, or you know, this is, I mean, this doesn't have to be its own debate, perhaps, but I mean, this is something that it seems that Parliament should have a function of airing out being the being the tip of the spear in terms of actually dealing with toxic issues and sort of making uh, uh, having a sounding as to the the scope and the purchase of these opinions and the the relation of these opinions on public discourse and uh, way, ways that, that people think about things. Um, the idea that law is not going to be applied to some people, essentially, um, because they complain about history. And so, essentially, they, they don't like having the same justice that applies to everyone in the society apply to them, because they have a special grievance about history that they can um, air that they can sort of just speciously spit out as a as a get out of, as a literally get out of jail free card. I mean, it is somewhat disgusting, banking on racialist politics in that way. When these laws apply to everyone equally. Under the current dispensation. Um, So, yeah, I don't, I can't think off the top of my head what the subject might be of other debates and who can sort of bring up debates, but in the same way that people just talk about almost sometimes philosophical notions and debate philosophical notions or, or general, um, just general issues in some sense, a kind of, um, I feel like if Parliament doesn't gauge in something like that, in order to develop the different treatment of ideological issues, I mean, I guess this is perhaps problematic for the DA because maybe the DA does not have um, a single, it does not want a coherent um, ideological voice. It, it does not have a settled canon of how it deals with these things. And so it, it is so fractious that it is not able to properly put down and contend with the, the toxic and vile politics of the EFF, perhaps because they have some members which are essentially in the same vision of identity politics. Um, and they see themselves as, as rather a broad church, and so they're not really capable of, of contending with these, these, these issues. Um, because in principle, uh, they are um, they are neutral to these these kinds of contentions, and so they are forced in being ravaged by uh, the the EFF rhetoric. And essentially, if if measured by the same ideological framework of identity politics, they will never be able to escape being called racist because they will always be more racist than the EFF, because it's a matter of degree. If you believe in structural racism, racism is always a matter of degree. It's not a matter of yes or no. And in fact, the only way that you can hope, uh, hope uh, uh, to not be racist is to promise that you will engage in a form of racism that will have in its promise, in its prediction, will at the end of the process not be racist. But while it gets there, it will even employ racism of a different sort, of, of, of the converse side. Of, of the, so it's a kind of equilibrium game. It's a horse trading. It's a revenge uh, mongering, you know, uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very um, dominating ideological you know, form of, of, of attrition, where you have this demagogue at the top essentially saying, well, this army and that army are going to somewhat clash, and they're going to be casualties, but uh, this is the only way uh, to, to sort of take the ideology forward in, in, um, 
and seeing where things lie at, at, at on the other side um you know it, it's sort of it's it's married to this kind of creative destruction that's what identity politics effectively is it's a giant experiment in which the dignity of the individual is uh is is a promise as as an as an afterthought after the consequence uh has been brought about by their their mechanical process which uh essentially imposes a dehumanized degradation um, in, in the process and essentially they get away with that because they have the stark dichotomy between well other people have it way too good and there's no way that we're going to wait for for history to transform the situation we have to do it as a political directive uh, directed from the top directed from a concentration of power and all the corruption that that has involved with it and all the tailoring of reality and all the the the, the propaganda and control of perception that everyone has to believe that we're all at the point at which the the political leadership says that we're at so it creates this kind of orthodoxy that no one is allowed to argue with and this is why no one goes off the identity politics script and in fact, if they can't bully people to get onto the script, then they get very agitated, essentially, that they're not making their ideological progress. You know, it is, it is a toxic form of vile, racialist, um, you know, it, it, it is totalitarian in essence. Um, and essentially, sadly, it just spreads fascistic values. That's all it does. That, that, that's its end product, is identity consciousness. It doesn't produce results on the ground. It doesn't produce alleviation of poverty. It, in fact, promotes the a kind of the spread of harm and and a kind of um, you know destruction in some sense, a kind of a fair destructive force. So they can co control destruction, and then they can gain progress by by everyone believes in the same identity consciousness that's how they measure progress is by how right they are as ideologues not how successful they are as as politicians as as um administrators of of policy of makers of policy they have a completely different metric of success the more people that agree with, with their perceptions of revenge So in summation, I'm basically saying is that uh, the role of the speaker should be sensitive to prosecuting the issues of the day. And in as much as there are kind of cheap political shots that are kind of like um, being thrown around, you know, which would almost be, um, which are kind of making their point because they're able to sort of pretend like they want to have the debate, but they're not really interested in having the debate. That that those that those points are segued into a mini debate on that issue or on that point, um, and that you know perhaps you know because essentially the the level of arrested argumentation is essentially playing into the hands of a kind of, of, of a very dumbed down political discourse and so either we need to have um, you know being being be able to segue into a mini debate or having having essentially you're not allowed to make a fake point of order essentially what you should do is you should essentially make a, a general point that is an invitation towards um, going towards having a mini debate on that topic. And so you, you don't stand up and make a point of order, you stand up and you essentially suggest an intervention that um, the speaker at some point table a mini debate on that political point or that political issue or you know, so, so, so that it actually, ha there is a facility in which it is, um, it is debated properly rather than this kind of like cheap debate where there's no real um, exchange of, of, you know, the merits of whatever point is being raised and essentially it gets away w with its, um, 
with its kind of, you know, its superficial and pretentious kind of, um, you know, which essentially does service to the function of Parliament, which is to hash out um, uh, discourse, uh, essentially, and to make progress on, on, on issues. And in as much as these issues continually are raised and are not properly, um, uh, you know, they don't find a definitive resolution because they're always in a state of, of kind of arrested, um, you know, because they're not made in, the, in a legitimate way. They're, they're, they're raised um, in an ill-suiting, um, in an ill-suited instrument of, of, of a point of order which is actually a point of argument and you know and then these arguments essentially never amount to something that you can hear the other side of because it was essentially um contended in an illegitimate form um in a, in a and so unless you have a speaker that is sensitive to essentially counting up um these issues and and trying to sort of suggest an overarching themed mini debate on that kind of issue that at least all sides can be heard on it or, or something like that or you know if, if at least if there was some kind of facility like that then people wouldn't be abusing the the parliamentary procedure essentially to score cheap political points which essentially destabilizes the integrity and the functioning of the house um, and so without a, a facility like that I, I, I just Feel it just plays right into the hand hands of, of sort of demagoguery and uh, you know you know the idea that if someone is going to make a, a political speech other people aren't going to have um, an argument against it you know uh, and and then they don't have a form or a forum uh, through which to kind of um, raise a general contention. I mean, I guess, oh, you see, I, I, I'm not familiar with all the details. Um, if there are actually procedures f for people to essentially hash out these kinds of things, and essentially it's just a form of, of um, immature um, engagement uh, because essentially they don't want to go through the official channel because if they went through the official channel and had a real debate, it wouldn't, you know, they score a lot more political points essentially by debasing the whole procedure, um, by essentially uh, disrupting the, s the structural um, imperfection which they are uh, um, comporting themselves as the, as the saviour and solution to. Um, and then essentially the other side never gets to be heard because they're asserting that in, an, in a in an ill procedural kind of conveyance and therefore uh, it's not open to be challenged because it shouldn't have even been um, voiced in that form at that time you know um, although as I said these kinds of issues I mean are some political parties, I think, can deal with them more coherently than others. In some sense, COPE has had a much more consistent and coherent line of disagreement with the kind of identity politics that has occurred, whereas the DA has, almost like the President of the Republic, has s sat on the fence slightly and tried to sort of um, play this weird kind of middle ground. I mean, I, I do think that we do suffer from the lack of prominent black leadership um, dismantling uh, a very vile and disgusting forms of racialist discourse and racialist morality. You know, we don't, uh, um, we definitely have a void in our politics. Uh, you know, because in, in essence, how are you ever going to dismantle black racism if, you, if there is essentially no black leadership? willing to contend with it or, or stand up to it or, or voice some kind of, um, you know, but I mean, these issues, their, their, their complications are, and, and the 
unwillingness and the cowardice of South African politics to confront these issues um, and therefore allow the, uh, the convolution of, of these issues into a toxic racialist politics. Um, so much so that we have uh, in Parliament uh, uh, a process which seeks to essentially racialize the property clause in the Constitution. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, the state of South African politics, the ravaged state, um, which goes hand in hand with the, with the state corruption, because it is the same complex of ideological corruption. The faction within the ANC that is the same politics as the EFF, uh, eating up the state um, into this racialist monster, uh, and essentially no effective voice in, in um, deconstructing its, its uh, dishonest maneuvering and its dishonest rhetoric. Um, yeah, I, I I do think uh, more responsible speakers would would somewhat force these issues into the light, as it were, in constructing something like mini general debates, even if they don't go perfectly, even if they don't fully resolve it, at least then you have an idea about where people stand on the matter, where the, po where the political parties stand on the matter. At least there's 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 vision on this ideological field or, or on the political field. Uh, the, the landscape becomes tangible rather than this uh, intransigence um, in which the destabilization of fascistic uh, politics essentially will, will eventually inherit the mess that they are trying to work toward, that they are trying to sow the seeds of, of a, a disintegrated um, political discourse. And in as much as um, everything facilitates their um, destabilizing influences and as much as people don't understand the style of their politics and contradict the style and confront that style directly, uh, sadly, they end up getting their way just through attrition, just through the, the demoralization, effectively, of, of liberal politics, of, of liberal democratic politics gets replaced uh, by identity politics. <clears throat> 